o tēnā tātou katoa. Nau mai harau mai ki tēnei kaupapa, ko huhi mai nei tātou. Uh, e raro te maru o tēnei whare o te papa tongarewa. Tuatahi me tuku wai, mihi ki te wahi ngaro, nō reira kei noi tātou. Te māngai ngana hera pono i te toko turu tapu. A kuinga mai a koutou aroha noa pa heretia ki te rangi mādi i ngā wākatoa. Te māngai tautoku mai, aia nei, āke nei, ai. Uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's lecture. Um, firstly, I would like to just welcome you all to Te Papa Tongarewa and to Rongo Marairoa and to Te Hono Ki Hawaiki um, on behalf of uh, Mana Whenua as well as our Iwian residents from Wolfkata, um, no mai, haere mai, piki mai. I would also like to welcome um, the family Ruth Harley and Amelia to this kaupapa. Um, those who have come in person, um, those of you online, um, and also Professor Kylie Message in Australia, tēnei te mihi ake kia tātou. Uh, my name is Migoto, I'm the head of Mātauranga Māori here at Te Papa, and um, I'll be just taking a few minutes to introduce this kaupapa, and I'll be handing straight over to uh, Conal McCarthy. Uh, the Michael Volkerling Memorial Lecture recognises the legacy of doc Dr Michael Volkerling. This is the fifth annual D Michael Volkerling Memorial Lecture. After receiving his PhD from the University of Auckland, Michael became the youngest person to be appointed as the director of the Queen Elizabeth II Arts Council, known as Creative New Zealand, from 1994. After 11 years as the head of the Arts Council, he moved on to his role as the executive director of the National Museum and National Art Gallery. Between 1998 and 1993, he played a key role in the development of Te Papa after overseeing the amalgamation of the National Museum and the National Art Gallery and framing the legislation for the Museum of New Zealand in 1992. He then went on to establish and teach in the Museum and Heritage Studies program at Victoria University of Wellington. This long association with museums and academia continued for the rest of his career and he trained many of the new generation of museum professionals. He spent his last 20 years in tertiary education in areas of management, teaching and research while maintaining connections with museums. He held positions at the Wellington Institute of Technology as Director in the Centre for Creative Industry, Industries, Director of Research and Evaluation at Arts New South Wales, adjunct professor at the Centre for Cultural Studies and the Creative Economy, and finally as Principal Research Fellow at the Institute for Culture and Society at the University of Western Sydney, where he was involved in the early stages of the ARC-funded research project, Australian Cultural Fields. He was also a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Cultural Policy and the Asia-Pacific Journal of Arts Management. Michael was a passionate advocate for the cultural life of New Zealanders. Through the annual Michael Volkerling Lecture, the connection between Victoria University and Te Papa continues. This lecture series is a partnership between National Services Te Paerangi and the Museum and Heritage Studies Programme as an acknowledgement of the lasting connection first forged by Michael Volkerling and therefore in his memory. I would like to now introduce Dr. Connell McCarthy, who has been Director of the Museum and Heritage Studies Program at Victoria University of Wellington since 2005. Professor McCarthy was previously a Curator of Art and Lecturer in Art History at Waikato University from 2003 to 2005, and also worked at Te Papa from 1996 to 2000. He is the author of The History of the Institution, published in 2018, on its 20th anniversary, tēnā koe kono. Kia ora. Kia ora uh, kia ora hui mai tātou. Ka nui ngā mihi ki a koutou hara mai nei i tēnei pō. Uh, he tino pai ki a, ki a kite a koutou hara mai nei, ki te whakarongo ki tēnei kaufau i tēnei pō. Uh, he tino pai ki te mahitahi uh, te here ngā waka me te pairangi uh, me te papa. Uh, nō reara, kia ora hui mai tātou. Thanks, Migoto, for that introduction. Welcome, everybody. Very nice to see a small, keen audience here tonight at Te Papa for the annual Michael Volkling Memorial Lecture, and a special uh, hello to Ruth coming along tonight. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's speaker. And over the last few years in the Michael Volkling Lecture, we've had a number of speakers 
from around the world who have tried to bring together museum studies and museum practice, uh, beginning uh, with the International Federation of Human Rights Museums Conference that was here at Te Papa a few years ago, where Richard Sandell from the University of Leicester talked about museums and human rights. Uh, we've had Huhana Smith and Bob Jaynes talking about museums and climate change. Uh, John Carty from Australia talking about museums and indigenous issues. And last year we had Tony Bennett from the University of Western Sydney that uh, Migoto mentioned talking about issues to do with museums, culture and class. And of course Michael was involved with the University of Western Sydney um, in, in recent years so that was really appropriate that Tony Bennett was here last year speaking. This year we have another speaker from Australia. Uh, Professor Kylie Message is the head of the Humanities Research Centre at the Australian National University in Canberra. She's a long-standing uh, museum scholar. Her first book was published in 2006 by Berg called uh, New Museums and the Making of Culture. And since then, she's done a lot of uh, teaching and thesis supervision in the Museums and Collections program at the ANU. And she's the series editor for a, a really interesting Rutledge series called Museums in Focus, which publishes short books on topical issues. And within that series, Kylie herself uh, has published books on museums and activism, uh, museums and racism, and other related controversial issues. So it's great to have Kylie address us tonight, all the way from Canberra. Uh, and her topic is, a, is, is one that's really current. So she is going to be talking to us about museums and the citizenship of hate. So welcome, Kylie. Really nice to have you here with us tonight, and I'll hand over to you now. Kia ora tato. Uh, thank you, Connell. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for that introduction, uh, and also for inviting me to deliver the lecture tonight. It is a little bit strange doing it uh, so far away. I can not really see faces, but um, we'll see how we go, I suppose. I'd also like to thank Ruth Harley and uh, Ruth's family and acknowledge National Services to Parangi and Victoria University of Wellington for hosting the event tonight. As Connell said, I'm speaking to you from Canberra, which is unceded Ngunnawal and Ngambri lands. I pay my respects to Ngunnawal and Ngambri elders, past, present and emerging. And I acknowledge all First Nations people who might be in the audience tonight. So, no good title in 2021 for a public lecture doesn't include some form of clickbait, so please excuse mine. What I essentially want to talk to you about today is if and how national museums, which have in recent decades adopted a remit for social rights activism, have an obligation to engage with a broad spectrum of political participation and expression, including contemporary forms of far-right extremism and white grievance politics. Ultimately, the goal for museums may be to represent hate without providing legitimacy or a platform for its ideas or actors, to offer information and analysis, to equip institutions and, institu and individuals to better understand the impact of hate crime and its continued presence, and the necessity of standing up against the culture of fear that it generates. But the question of how to do this, or even if this is the right thing to do, is not straightforward. I'm afraid I won't have many answers for you in my talk today. Just questions, lots, lots of questions. In fact, this talk is more like a thought exercise for me as much as it is for you than it is a series of, or, or case studies or a report on research findings. Partly this is because the research that I'm doing is based primarily in the US and I haven't been able to travel there for two years because of COVID. But it's also because it's a really difficult topic and I don't think anyone has worked out exactly how to approach it yet. So I'm not going to focus on specific cases, although we can think through some of these in question time. Instead, I want to suggest some possible ways forward, offer some tools for our thinking and consider the language 
that might work for problematic cases. As I said, this, top, this topic is difficult and perhaps it's one that's better left alone. And even if I get it wrong, as I'm sure to do, I still feel like it's worth trying to engage with some of the issues and the dialogue the topic generates. As I grappled with writing this introduction earlier this week, I read a profile piece in The Guardian about the architect Herzog and de Meuron. It said, architecture is the art of facts. We shouldn't have a moralistic standpoint. It struck me as perhaps offering a useful segue into the topic for today. What, if anything, can architecture contribute to freedom and justice and the struggles of human existence? Asks a journalist. Or is it its job just to stand back and look ornamental while the dramas and traumas of the planet go on around it? This is a similar discourse to what has been applied by museums in the last two or three decades. Um, next slide, please. So I think that this little anecdote, this lecture or this um, article in The Guardian brings us to the topic for today. The idea that museums are political as well as cultural sites, organisations and communities is, an important but in, is a simple but important one. This understanding was deeply held by Dr. Michael Volkelin, after whom this lecture is named. Dr. Dr. Volkelin was widely recognised as a cultural visionary. He was, amongst other things, one of the principal architects of New Zealand's cultural and creative sectors. He led the Arts Council, or uh, known as Creative New Zealand, for 12 years, uh, 11 years and was involved in the amalgamation of the National Museum and National Art Gallery and the de development of Te Papa. According to an obituary in NZ Edge, here I'm quoting, this was at a tumultuous time in New Zealand politics and society. The Muldoon years with the Springbok tour, protests against French nuclear testing in the South Pacific, Maori land rights, women's rights, gay rights, and then the election of the fourth Labor government with its attendant free market policies and share market boom and bust. A key moment in Michael's directorship was the Tamaori exhibition at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1984, a milestone in the Maori cultural renaissance, unquote. Dr. Volkling knew that culture was not just political, but that it could make significant contributions to political practices and institutions, as well as national understandings of selfhood. He established the Museum and Heritage Studies program at Victoria University, which was one of the first programs of its kind in our part of the world. My own path crossed Michael's in 2002 at a cultural uh, policy conference held at Te Papa, that he invited me to speak at. He was very kind to me and engaged intellectually and seriously with my work, even though I was a very junior lecturer working at another department at VW. I was particularly drawn to Michael's ability to speak across and through the often polarised spheres of politics and culture. I'm honoured and moved to be speaking in his honour tonight, and I hope I do justice to his legacy. Next slide, please. Thank you. So my own research has focused on the relationships between museums, citizenship, government, and political reform movements. In recent years, I've been particularly interested in contemporary cause-based collecting by museums such as the National Museum of the American Indian, the National Museum of American History, and the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And I've been curious to know how these national museums have been involved in and identified as sites of activism as well as con controversy. I've explored ways racism has been addressed in national museums, 
as well as the history of curatorial activism in the US. I've conducted research into 2010 Tea Party actions and the 2011 Occupy Wall Street and its documents and collections. And I've sought to understand how the legacy of social reform movements is documented for different purposes, different stakeholders and audiences, as well as for history with an uppercase H. I've been especially interested in the role of curators and the obligation expressed by a number of people I've worked with to provide representation of alternative worldviews, even when understood as reprehensible or abhorrent to individual staff members or institutional remits. Beyond providing accuracy to historical representation, the necessity of, and here I'm quoting one curator, having to collect the protest signs I don't agree with, may contribute to more sophisticated social understandings associated with the challenges of representing hate without giving it a platform for additional visibility or attention. I am particularly interested in public expressions of citizenship. The contract between individuals and the state and the ways that people perform citizenship practices in public spaces, particularly through participation in political rallies and social reform movements. National museums, as we know, also offer spaces of citizenship performance and have also been sites of protest. Next slide, please. Have we changed? Connell, can you give me a thumbs up? Yep, okay, thank you. Okay, so where to start? Maybe with a reminder that museums always reflect and embody the zeitgeist of the period in which they're produced. They're also always tied to the broader category or genre of history, as well as to the everyday ordinary, as well as spectacular ways in which histories are understood represented, commemorated, and contested. People here today will be familiar with the ways in which public museums have traditionally protected and prosecuted the interests of nationalism, extending to projects of colonialism, nation building, and civic engagement. Many of you will also know that the shifts to professionalisation of museum practice that emerged through the development of UNESCO in 1945 and ICOM, the International C Council of Museums, in 1946, were aligned with the impetus to protect the human rights and freedoms inscribed into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. Developed in the aftermath of World War II and specifically the atrocities of the Holocaust, the declaration was a response to the barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind from one of its preambles. It promised to usher in a new era founded on the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. However, as the global events of recent years and intervening decades have demonstrated, human rights, like museums, have relational meanings and reflect historical legacies, legacies social norms and the expectations, as well as the challenges of any given contemporary time. Issa Shivji counsels us that human rights should not be understood as having a static definition removed from human experience or the governance of individuals and populations. It is, he says, a term susceptible to political utility and manipulation as well as resistance. Human rights, he says, mirror the struggles and concerns of the dominant social groups in society at a particular time as these groups organise and reorganise to maintain their position. At the same time, rights formulation and articulation reflect, albeit in a subordinate position, 
the resistance of the dominated as they strive to change the status quo. Human rights, therefore, like any other systematized regimes of articulated ideas, is a contested terrain. Next slide, please. I'm not going to address all of my PowerPoint slides as I move through my talk, although I'm happy to return to them in discussion time. But I do want to briefly mention this one. The image on my left um, shows the entrance to a 1968 temporary exhibition at the National Museum of American History that had been curated to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Hanging underneath the human rights credo was the exhibition's signature item, a memorial banner to Martin Luther King Jr., which had been handmade by residents of, Re of Resurrection City on the Smithsonian Mall during the Poor People's Campaign earlier that same year. The banner was especially symbolic given the assassination of Dr. King, which occurred only a few months before the exhibition opened. The image on my right shows what was left of the banner after it was attacked and destroyed by an arsonist in the museum gallery. The person responsible for the attack was never apprehended by police. Certainly, and as the images in this slide point to, the decades following World War II have not been free of further persecution of individuals and groups. People here today may, may know of or have associations with the Federation of International Human Rights Museums or with particular museums, networks and organisations that seek to progress human rights principles including but not limited to agenda, identity and cause-based museums dedicated to genocide and the Holocaust, human rights, migration, slavery, torture and political or social oppression. Uh, and it's appropriate to insert a footnote here, of course, a reminder that the first Michael Volklin Memorial Lecture, which was presented by the wonderful Professor Richard Sandel, was held at Te Papa in, in 2015 as part of the International Federation of Human Rights Museums Conference that year. Even more of you will recognise that in recent decades, there has been a growing chasm between the aspirations of nationalism, where, it's nationally, where it is narrowly defined by alt-right extremists, self-identified with militant nationalism and white supremacy in the US and Europe, for example, and the mandates of the Declaration of Human Rights. As sites of public culture that increasingly adopt the idea that they should progress social justice agendas, national museums, which remain for the most state funded, are particularly prone to becoming caught up in and by this space of contestation. Heated debate over the relationship between nationalism, political interference in public memory and historical representation on the one hand and human rights edicts on the other hand are of course nothing new. In recent decades, the history and culture wars in Australia, the US and elsewhere affected and perhaps directed public discourse about the role of commemorative memorials and the history curriculum taught at schools, as well as the kind of history represented in museums. Museums have been attacked for being unpatriotic or subject to political correctness. In Canberra, the opening of the National Museum of Australia, which the then Prime Minister, John Howard, referred to as very unmuseum-like at its launch in 2001, is a textbook example. Howard's view was that the museum represented a left-wing black armband view of history that downplayed colonial white achievements. However, museums have also been criticized by members of community groups and other interest groups for not being politically inclusive or activist enough 
or for sticking too closely to the government of the day's party line. The opening of the National Museum of the American Indian on the National Mall in Washington DC in 2004, for example, generated debate on this issue. The 1984 Tamari exhibition and the 1992 establishment and 1998 opening of the Museum of New Zealand to Papa Tongaruewa, both of which were globally significant undertakings that Michael Volkling was involved with, also occurred during the very early phases of this key period. Next slide, please. Without wanting to further revisit this extended contested past, all the rich literature that has been developed about it, it's relevant to note the ways that diverse viewpoints often coalesce into ideological positions that led to or exacerbated tensions. At the heart of this conflict, in the case of the Australian and US history wars, for instance, were disputes about museums in the late 1980s and 1990s that were starting to reflect the view that museums should be agents of social justice. This belief emerged as a result of changes in the museum sector that advocated for the increasing empowerment of minority groups through access, control and authority over self-representation. In addition to reflecting the post-World War II expansion of the human rights agenda, this process arose from demands by Indigenous and other groups for the return of cultural patrimony and for greater agency over collections. A surge in community identified, located and governed museums and networks accompanied an expansion of knowledge about museum practice facilitated as a result of the increasing professionalisation and recognition of volunteer expertise implicit within the post-war establishment of the International Council of Museums and other organisations. Next slide, please. Following this pattern of development, museums have increasingly sought to adopt the identity of activist institutions. This usually means that they embrace and act from a place of social justice and aspire to be inclusive, to collaborate with minority or marginalised groups and enable agency and self-representation for these groups whilst starting a process of self-reflection and critique of their own complicity with structural racism and the colonial endeavour. They have given voice to social justice justice movements through various actions, including uh, collecting signs, banners, buttons and ephemera from current day protests. In taking on this remit, they very fundamentally contrast with and seek to actively counteract the primary goal of racist hate speech, which is to inhibit the ability of the targets of hate speech to talk back. Hate speech aims at a basic level to exclude its targets from participating in broader deliberative processes. Next slide, please. And yet, despite its well-meaning association with social justice causes, the activist turn has generated some complex challenges for museums. This is particularly the case for museums that seek to problematise homogenous images of national identity, engage in self-reflective practice, or which represent national histories inclusive of human rights abuses. The situation has become acute in recent years, with scholars noting that a mainstreaming of, race and, of racist, xenophobic, Islamophobic and misogynist hate speech in the US public sphere accompanied the rise of Donald Trump, even before his election as US president. The spate of nooses found in museum grounds on the US National Mall throughout 2019 and 2020 suggests that even where a space for potential dialogue and education exists, it has been appropriated as a symbolic opportunity to promote fear. Furthermore, 
Some commentators argue that the language of white supremacy is trending back in to mainstream society with more common references to nooses, which are alongside the Confederate flag, an increasingly ubiquitous expression of hate. Others in the US observe that the nooses have always been there and that they will be for years to come. Either way, as Holland Cotter observed in 2017, and here I'm quoting, the culture wars are back. So is the civil rights movement. So is the civil war. They were all in evidence in Charlottesville, Virginia on August the 12th, when a protest over the planned removal from a city park of a statue of the Southern Civil War General Robert E. Lee exploded in violence. Two sets of protesters met and clashed. A battalion of white nationalists, neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klaners, and a crowd of counter-protesters, some with Black Lives Matter placards. Then there was a second explosion, this one on the internet, when President Donald J. Trump responded after a significant pause with an equivocating message. He blamed both sides for the violence. What about the alt left that came charging, he asked. He pronounced Robert E. Lee the equal of George Washington. He praised the beauty of the Lee statue and lamented the loss of other Confederate monuments, unquote. Next slide, please. <coughs> One of the things I take from statements like this is that it's one thing for museums to represent historical injustice or human rights abuses alongside a high profile push for contemporary collecting from left wing protest and reform movements like uh, climate change activism, Black Lives Matter, refugee justice or the Me Too movement. But it's another thing altogether to be faced with escalating expressions of right-wing extremism or ethno-nationalism that seek explicitly and directly to restrict or annul the freedoms and protections afforded by the law, rather than expanding and protecting the full spectrum of practices associated with belonging to a contemporary multicultural nation. This category might also include proponents of fake news, and anti-vaccination, anti-lockdown movements, claiming that public health measures infringe on the rights of individuals within society. How then, how then can we start to think across to bridge the gulf between hate speech advocates and the museums and other institutions like schools, universities, some media perhaps, that seek to provide education and other programs to, counter effect, to counteract the effects of their words. Next slide, please. This is important to think about because hate speech functions through antagonism. It's confrontational and often terrifying, designed to create a sense of possibility for an alternative structure of perceived normality and normalization. However, acts of fear mongering are not just forms of distraction. They are exercises in testing or challenging the legitimacy of legislation and community standards around freedom of expression. In so doing, they reveal the tensions between, main between maintaining freedom of expression and curbing racism in all parts of the world. Political scientist Eric Bleich refers to this tension as a fundamental dilemma for liberal democracies. The conundrum that is caused by this fundamental dilemma means that there is little space for dialogue between museums, governmental organisations and proponents of the extreme right. Which brings us, of course, to our key problem. How might national museums as sites of cultural safety and civic leadership respond to articulations of citizenship that go against the majority view of acceptable ideology and behaviour. Expressions of hate may include hate mail or statements in visitor books or web comments 
events su such as physical protests and attacks, and the symbolism associated with certain items being left on museum grounds or in exhibitions. National museums face a conundrum when it comes to these expressions, which are part of their own institutional experience and legacy, part of a broader culture of racism, as well as being a form of citizen activism, albeit a minority one. Expressions of hate, such as historical Ku Klux Klan materials at the National Museum of American History, for example, have in the past been deemed not in the public interest and have been removed from sight and in fact deaccessioned. National museums need to grapple with this problem though because, because of their own role as regulatory government institutions that speak to and guide citizenship understandings and practices and because of their recent interest in representing political reform and protest movements and actions. But how can they do it without providing legitimacy or a platform for the ideas being expressed? The fact that museums have themselves increasingly become the target of hate crimes suggests that their cultural capital and influence is recognised amongst people targeting them as sites for, for hate crimes. It means that there is more than just academic value to demonstrating what happens when different understandings of citizenship come into conflict. Next slide, please. Might there even be an ethical imperative then for museums to engage with extraordinary hate acts, such as nooses left on museum grounds, as well as the socio-political context in which the normalisation of extreme anti-democratic thought occurs? To be honest, I, I just don't know. What I do know though, is that collection materials and evidence of historical incidences of hate do exist at many museums. I first came about this when I was researching activism at the National Museum of American History and found records of Ku Klux Klan materials. That same research trip occurred in uh, 2010 at the height of the conservative Tea Party movement in the USA. And I recorded a contemporary protest on the National Mall for the museum's division of political history. This is where the images on my right on the slide come from. The image on the uh, top left is from um, an exhibit at the Museum of the City of New York, which I took in uh, 2017. It's meant as a contrast, obviously. The National Museum of African American History and Culture has dealt with histories of hate more directly in, re in recent years. And the Immigration Museum in Melbourne opened an exhibition in 2011 called Yours, Mine, Ours, which explores who we are, who others think we are, what it means to belong and not belong in Australia and experiences of racism. Next slide, please. If there is an imperative for museums to represent forms of expression considered by the most to be antisocial, how might they do it? How do museums represent key national events, such as the anti-government attack on the US Capitol on 6th of January this year? This is a really interesting event to me um, that was widely viewed as an attack on political culture where pro-gun expressions functioned as a proxy for racist beliefs and where national, museum, uh, national meaning was forced into becoming a transactional item volleyed between protesters and the symbolic site of the Capitol building. My sense is that this example may provide a key one to unpack the idea of accountability in relation to what hate, hate studies scholar John Berger calls the grey areas between free speech and violence inspiring hatred. These grey areas are, he says, where extremism can flourish and where hate watch groups and museum activists and investigative journalists and anyone seeking to do this work can find themselves in very challenging territory. 
My specific question here is how this event will be documented by the US Capitol's own historical society, its records, and how will it be represented by the other national museums, particularly the National Museum of African American History and Culture and the National Museum of American History, which also have clear stakes in the narrative produced. The model for commemorating the victims of terrorism attacks, uh, such as the 9-11 memorial, does not seem applicable in this case. Perhaps the answer might be in engaging with the academic materials that grapple with free speech legislation or attempt to navigate the dilemma between how to maintain freedom of expression but condone hate speech, keeping in mind that this work tends to emphasise the legal and governmental apparatus of regulation at the expense of the implications and impact and effects of hate speech on human subjects and communities. In preparing for this lecture last week, I read an article by the New Zealand Race Relations Commissioner, Mr Meng Foon, that has stayed with me for its eloquence and relevance. He explained that, the easier it is for us to dehumanise others and see them as anonymous or two-dimensional caricatures, the easier it is for us to turn them into targets of our own unexamined frustrations. If we want to understand what makes someone lose their awareness, their respect for basic human rights, their compassion, and then unload on some unsuspecting stranger, perhaps we need first to look in the mirror. Collectively, yes, but individually too. When I read this, I thought, aha, this, now this is what museums might be able to do. Next slide, please. So, the need for the research that I'm suggesting here has become crystallised and more urgent over recent years. The more I investigate progressive left wing forms of museum activism, the more questions I have about its limits, the more questions I have about hate speech and the also escalating actions associated with right wing extremism. Even though the field of museum activism is rapidly growing and is deeply important and impactful, it typically focuses on left-wing and social justice forms of activism. As a consequence, there is no substantive work that directly considers the experience, representation and impact of hate on museums. This absence means that there is a disconnect between museums' increased commitment to and engagement with social justice activism and the escalating attention attracted by far-right political parties, social movements and groups. The disconnect also means that there is no comprehensive conceptual and methodological toolkit to investigate the diverse expressions of hate in the, in the multi-organisational fields it occupies and seeks to disrupt. Next slide, please. Some reporting and analysis of hate at museums exists. This occurs mostly in the form of news articles, reports by hate watch groups, and some academic articles. Topics include short reports of hate acts occurring at museums, projections that museums will increasingly become identified as targets by domestic terrorists, and methodologies for studying hate, often intended for journalists. There is precedent for writing about hate in the context of Holocaust and human rights focused museums. And recent years has seen the development of a new field of hate studies, which is increasingly associated with university-based institutes or centres that seek to promote scholarly and public outcomes. One such example is the Herbert and Valme Freilich project for the study of bigotry at my own institution, which aims to support research into the causes, histories, and the effects of ethnic cultural, religious and sexual, big, sexual bigotry and animosity to promote public discussion of how such intolerance can be combated by educational and social programs. Interestingly, 
the slow establishment of hate studies as a field in countries like Canada, the US and the UK, which at least tout themselves as strongly committed to eliminating prejudices and racism, have been explained by scholar Barbara Perry as being a failure or a denial even to acknowledge that hate and the violence associated with it remain a part of our culture. The absence until now of studies of hate in and at museums may be the result of a similar failure or denial about how to engage with that culture. However, as key instruments of civic culture, museums are, I think, significant places to host and extend the discussions that will arise as a result of acknowledging hate. Next slide, please. But again, how, how can museums critically address hate speech without extending or consolidating the structural socio-political conditions under which singular concepts of white nationalism, racism, hate and fear thrive and become normalised? I'm really interested in the work of Sindra Bangstad, who advocates for a different tactic, suggesting that an anthropological lens can bridge rather than exacerbate the distinctions existing between disciplines primarily affiliated with political and legal studies and other more grounded forms of analysis concerned with victim impact and the effect of certain events or conditions. His approach requires the construction of a conversation between a museum case study and its context. That is the environment within which the museum, for example, operates. Uh, interestingly, that I think is what the Immigration Museum uh, exhibition, which I just mentioned, does very effectively. And the image on my right shows uh, one example of an installation at that um, museum where audience members are encouraged to come and experience what it is like to feel um, to, to be vic the victim of racist speech uh, in, in a pseudo public space. It's, it's a very effective um, uh, mechanism. The image on, the on my right is also from the Museum of the City of New York. So museums need to engage with context. The context includes other instruments of governance, such as the media and policy initiatives, both, both of which act upon and help shape the public sphere. The appeal of this approach is that, re, that it refuses to accept hate speech's project of excluding its targets from participating in broader deliberative processes. It also avoids the trap of closing down the discussion about hate speech that can be an outcome of debates about racism, which can risk leaning in the favour of speech restriction and thereby further silencing everyone involved. Bankstad's approach identifies the need to acknowledge spaces of communication with individuals targeted by hate speech. It resonates that it resonates with the approaches that are increasingly being preferred by museums and museum studies in that it starts with the real life experiences of victims of hate speech in order to tell us exactly what hate speech sounds like and feels like and what it does. It focuses on hate speech's relation to power, social status, race and gender to elicit the often ignored or glossed over linkages between more mainstream discourses that feed on and into hate speech. And it maps the intersections and shared strategies that exist between forms of hate speech that target specific causes, such as immigration, Islam, uh, Black Lives Matter or feminism, and that contribute to a broader culture of fear and the normalization of hate speech. Next slide, please. So the project is a fundamentally simple but political one that works on the proposition that rehumanizing the victims of hate speech will be a powerful tool in the larger project of challenging the normalization of structural racism 
Many of the anthropological tactics he advises have an established precedent of being widely employed in museums globally, including those with a thematic focus on issues including migration, human rights, genocide, and extending also to include uh, many of the institutions and places associated with the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, as well as a very large number of identity-based and national museums globally, including the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which includes significant commentary about hate, race hate. It also reiterates the approach by Tad Stonka from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, who says that countering the rise of hate crime to foster changes in attitudes and behaviours requires museums to identify and respond to specific incidents. Adding to the, to the body of politically driven academic scholarship uh, represented by Bangstad is a rapidly growing genre of museums and exhibitions that have taken on the task of directly exploring the application and experience of migration policy, multicultural initiatives and public discourse and debate from a range of perspectives. The expansion of museums working with these subjects globally suggests that although it can sometimes seem as though there is little room for interaction between social justice activism, which is seen as rational and neutral, and hate speech, which is seen as irrational or abject, an increasing, perhaps ambivalent, opportunity has actually opened up, perhaps as a consequence of the increase, increasing ubiquity and mainstreaming of hate speech in contemporary life. In other words, the fact that nooses have been left on the grounds of museums reiterates the political function of culture and the significance of museums as sites of identity that can be used by museums as material evidence for public discussion. I've covered a really wide terrain in my presentation tonight, but I want to conclude by coming back to the question of how museums today can engage with and respond meaningfully to the upsurge in acts of violence perpetrated in the name of structural, collective, as well as personal ideologies based on hate, xenophobia and racism. Responding to this question requires museums to move beyond acts of symbolic national commemoration and grapple with the human expressions and experiences of, of hate in ways suggested, for example, by Bungstad. A contested present will obviously become a contested history in museological and other representations. So understanding how museums respond to contemporary conflict is relevant and requires a consideration of the conundrum about how personal narratives and experiences of what it means to be human fall within or intersect with representations of contested histories on a national scale as in the case of national museums, for example, or global platforms such as UNESCO and related organisations. This is even more important where the small scale personal stories disappear from the narrative frame, as they so often do in contexts where the politics of the nation are deeply polarised and the stakes for formal political players are high as in the case of political landscapes in which diversity is positioned as threatening homogenous symbols of national identity and national unity. Luckily, current museum scholarship and practice is increasingly open to embracing research into studies of emotion and affect, as well as activism and its shifting narratives. But more work could be done in drawing firmer links between what it means to be an empathetic human subject today and the challenge for museums in representing a humanity that is defined according to suprastate conventions that were written in the late 1940s to reflect the challenges and contestations of a previous era marked by international conflict. This requires recognition of structural factors that impact not, not just on governmental decision-making 
or on the creation of non-government organisational in in instruments, including ICOM, but on the creation of personal and collective belief systems and the ways in which these are replicated internally within the structures and operational modes employed by our diverse institutions, as well as the outward facing activities and representations they present publicly. My own view is that the task of curatorial activism is a self-reflexive one that should be focused first and foremost on affecting processes of structural, internal, institutional change. I suggest that this process can lead to improved understanding that our forms of being human are not just related to our interpersonal interactions in the private sphere, but that they influence and are impacted by all aspects of civic and institutional life including the ones that raise difficult questions or unpalatable truths about who we are individually and as citizens of the world to which we contribute. Thank you. Uh, kia ora tato. Thank you very much, Kylie, for uh, that lecture. Uh, which has, as you say, raised really challenging questions and uh, put up a mirror for us all to think about uh, these difficult issues and how museums can deal with them. I was really struck um, by several of the things you said. I've got a couple of questions uh, in mind, but I know that there are questions out here uh, in the audience, and I think some questions online. So I might canvas some questions from the audience first, just before mm. I pose some <coughs> of the questions that have come up for me. We have a microphone at the back of the room there with Victoria, and I think that um, Stephanie Gibson might have a question. <laughs> Who's a history curator here at Te Papa? Do you want to, Kylie? Thank you for your um, fascinating presentation that was really provocative and not quite what I expected. But I was wondering, your last comment about um, that looking internally, uh, we have been sort of slowly and quietly what we call maybe auditing our collections for um, signs of the colonial project and seeing how we can reframe our collections. Um, that's an ongoing project. It, we're all hands to the pump, but it just quietly happens behind the scenes. Is that what you mean about looking internally, that we can interrogate our collections and how they're interpreted and see them in new ways and present them in new ways? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And um, there are a few ways to answer it. Uh, I think when I first started doing this work, I, I, I really, I, I came across, I mean, I understand that, uh, you know, social activism has become very popular. There's, you know, like a whole industry around representations of, uh, of social activism now. But when I first came across this material, it was in the space of collections that hadn't been seen by the public. And uh, these were historical collections, but they were collections that had been um, created by curators in the 50s and 60s, moving into the 70s, but even as early as the late 50s at the National Museum of American History about the Ku Klux Klan, um, about some very difficult social um, instances. Uh, but there was no mechanism within that institution to formally accession that material. So those difficult materials ended up just being put under people's desks or into drawers or whatever. Um, the agency for collecting that material was the curators. So it was about individuals who felt that um, in order to represent the breadth of the historical moment, they needed to do more than what their institute, institutional remit allowed. Um, so over time, some of those collections made their way into education collections, others just disappeared. Um, some got moved into other museums eventually, but uh, it's a really interesting question, and it's a question as much about institutional 
identity as it is about the, the role of individuals within the institution. So for instance, now, um, I, I've shown a couple of examples from the Museum of the City of New York, and they undertook a collecting project as a lot of people did around Occupy Wall Street. Um, and they have a very curated in a very clean kind of sense, collection of material from, from that uh, event and that movement, which actually is very different from another uh, sibling collection that was collected by the, the movement's own collectors, which is a, a different story. And which until recently had no home at all institutionally. Um, however, I don't know that the Museum of the City of New York is also collecting less palatable forms of social reform movement. Um, and I suppose my question, my question really is, if museums are seeking to uh, re-identify as social justice agents, then what are the limits of that? Um, you know, how do you engage with the activist um, experience if you're not engaging with the full spectrum of what activism is? So I've kind of answered your question with, I guess, more questions and a little bit of a history um, uh, um, chronology from the US, but there's two things. It's, it's what individual curators do. Uh, and they can work within institutions or with external to institutions, but it's also about what the institution does and how the institution talks about its collecting policies. Thanks, Carly. Yeah, really, I was really struck there by the way you talked about, um, I guess, the liberal and the illiberal, and you alluded to the kind of gulf that's opened up the last few years in politics and culture between the left and the right, this kind of polarisation. And we see it even now with the pandemic and this difficulty of sort of speaking across or reaching across the aisle, this divide. And traditionally museums have positioned themselves as a sort of a bridge or a forum for debate. Uh, but you've posed lots of really interesting questions about how in collecting and exhibiting and policy and in, in university research, uh, people can try to engage with uh, less palatable uh, ideologies, shall we say. A question that occurred to me was whether this is even more difficult with national museums, which you talked about quite a lot. You also talked about museums like the Immigration Museum in Melbourne. Is it easier for smaller single-issue museums to grapple with these difficult issues than large <laughs> museums that work at a national scale? Yeah, I think it is. Um... I mean, small community-based or identity-based or cause-based or issue-based or, or whatever you want to call them, um, museums w m can have an advocacy um, role written into their remit or that it, their, their, um, their stakeholders might be quite clear, but that's not the case for national museums. National museums are supposed to represent the, the breadth of citizenship. Now, um, that's why I kind of keep coming back to this idea of citizenship because um, even though we don't see, or I presume, I mean, I don't see the, the kinds of expressions that I'm talking about as forms of citizen, citizenship, they are particularly if, if you think about the, the US Capitol building siege, which I think is the most useful one for us to think about. Um, if if you think about the actions by those actors, they were they were undertaking what they considered to be as a citizenship practice. So when I talk about citizenship, what, what do I mean? I mean, um, voting, participating in a, in a census, um, protesting freedom of speech, those kinds of things. So um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, the reason that national museums are so interesting about this is because they are tied to, to citizenship. They're civic institutions that have historically had um, a role in teaching us how to be good citizens, but when they're confronted with, with a practice that, we, that the majority find abhorrent, how, how do they deal with those things? Thanks, Carly. I think we have some more questions. There's one online, I think, um, but any more questions here in the room before we go to, I think it's Ashley online. No questions online. Any other questions here in the room? 
Yes, right at the back. Thank you very much, Kylie. It's been a very um, stimulating and challenging set of questions and, and ideas you've given us. One thing that your uh, lecture um, stimulated in my mind was the thought that at some stage, Te Papa is going to have to confront uh, the challenge, which won't be easy, of how it will present the history and the story of the Christchurch terrorist incident in which so many people were killed. I mean, it is an, a very important part of the New Zealand story. Um, but obviously it presents all kinds of challenges in terms of collecting artefacts associated with that event, given that it is so abhorrent to most New Zealanders, um, and to the point that um, collectively we don't even use the terrorist's name. Um, uh, now, I'm sure Te Papa will be up to this challenge, uh, but um, it may be some years before they come about it, but they do need to be thinking in the short term about collecting sort of ephemeral material which will otherwise disappear relating to that incident. So I thought I would put that to you as a sort of an example of a, of a contemporary challenge um, that fits within the broader framework of what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, look, that I think is a really cr critically difficult problem. Um, and maybe it's okay for museums to say, not now. Um, or, I mean, I think that you're right, that the, that the collection uh, activity probably does need to occur now. Um, but maybe it is too soon. And I'm not, I mean, I, this is not, um, that's not really the work that I've been doing. But there is a lot of work on um, commemoration of terrorist attacks in the US. And it really links more to that chronology of Holocaust Museum um, that I mentioned. In, I suppose the closest example I can think of is the 9-11 memorial um, and other similar, similar kind of commemorative um, spaces in the US where the focus has very much been on the victims and the, the lives of the people who, whose lives have been lost rather than the terrorist. Um, but it's interesting, you know, I've been thinking about this a little bit today, actually, because I knew this question would come up and I don't have an answer for it. Um, but I think, I think the answer will be different depending on the collecting institution. And that's why perhaps something like a memorial space can give a different narrative to than a national museum would. And for a national museum, I mean, for me, this, this, the focus on citizenship is really interesting and the, the key thing, because I think that one of the, um, the, the limitations of speaking just to, of speaking or exclusively to human experience is that it um, doesn't engage with the structural issues. So, you know, I, I suppose what I would be saying is, how does the museum represent the national polity? And what does the event in Christchurch say about national, um, you know, the national imaginary, which, you know, it may say nothing, I don't know. But so it, for a national museum, I would be looking at it differently, I think, to go back to Connell's question, um, than perhaps another kind of memorial site would. Not a great answer to your question, sorry. <laughs> uh, thanks, Collie. As we know, cats have taken over the internet and your um, Siamese, I think it is behind you there, is I'm trying to stealing the show. He's, he's eating something. <laughs> Steph, did you have a, a response to that question? I, sorry, I, I'll just say that Te Papa worked very closely with the Alexander Turnbull Library to collect a very substantial um, collection of the tributes that were laid after the Christchurch terror attacks. And so the collection uh, resides in both institutions, the majority is at Turnbull. Uh, Te Papa also collected quite widely uh, public responses, particularly in the landscape, um, which now has gone, like murals and ephemera, um, graffiti. Mm -hmm. 
and we collected poster art and um, uh, magazines that were devoted to uh, the stories of the victims. So we collected as broadly as we could at the time, but your question is very good. It's we need to keep collecting as time passes as well. Yeah, yeah and thinking about, the... you know, what does it tell, what does it say about um, cultural policies around, you know, inclusion, multiculturalism? What 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 else do those what what else does that event say in a national um, political context? I mean, maybe maybe the horror is is the story, but it might also be that there are other stories there as well. I was just going to add to to your point about maybe it is too soon. That was something that we were conscious of as well, and I was interested in that article that you had up about um, mm -hmm. no one knows their trauma to archivists. You know, being really conscious of of not swooping in, um, and we worked really closely with um, Canterbury Museum who, as you, as you say, had a different lens on it because of their um, being in the community and being on site. Um, so we were sort of conscious of that too, that their collecting would be different and we wanted them to lead. Is that fair? Yeah. Um, so we were very mindful of all of those um, factors of you know where we were at relative to other collecting institutions and tried to keep all of that in mind. Yeah, so yeah I mean... Yeah, has been doing real, some collecting. There's a real issue historically with what um, might be called helicopter collecting, where um, you, you know curators from institutions that are not local might kind of sweep in, you know, basically kind of just pick up stuff and then take it back to their um, their museums, and uh, they, and and often those those items are not properly kind of provenanced. They're not. Um, there's, there's, I mean, there's issues around intellectual property when you're talking about contemporary protest ac actions and, you know, like uh, uh, posters that people have made, for instance. There's all sorts of interesting things around that. Um, often the, the, there's not oral histories done or interviews done. So there's a whole lot of, um, and I'm just kind of talking more in terms of, you know, general protest movements, but there's a whole lot of really interesting things that... Uh, are not spoken about when it comes to, to, to collecting practices in um, those instances that uh, often really puts people people's noses out of joint, which I totally understand. Rowan. Kia ora. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention from the New Zealand Police perspective. So um, I'm the director of the New Zealand Police Museum and it should be acknowledged that uh, the criminal evidence from that case was destroyed by order of the judiciary, which has left, I believe, a very large gap, um, and the deniers will surface, for sure. The, um, there are some peripheral items that have been saved, and we are hoping that they will come into our collection, and they include the uniform that the detaining officers were wearing at the time, um, we're also working on a project at the moment, um, Hitoa Taumatarau, which is the place of many brave deeds, and it looks at different events across our history, particularly the 20th and 21st, and the final um, po within that uh, uh, memorial is the March 15th, 2019, and it will include the brave deeds of the civilians in particular, but also the police that worked on that, and keeping to the forefront the victims also. So we're doing that in partnership um, to make sure that it's a no surprises situation. I think that's really important, and always putting the victims at the front and centre of everything we do. So that's what we're doing with that. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that that sounds incredible. Um, and one of the things that I like about what you're saying is that there is a sense of integration across different government agencies. So um, one of the things that I always wanted to try and get my hands on was the, um, the police collection of Occupy Wall Street because um, the, there was a feeling that the, that the material that had been confiscated by the police from the movement was was like the best material really 
Um, I don't know if that exists or not. I haven't been able to access it, but um, what I do know is that different collections tell different stories uh, and all of those stories are really important when you're talking about not just um, a, an historical, social, political event, but when you're talking about trying to construct a sense of institutional um, responsibility. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, I've also done a fair bit of kind of uh, institutional or organisational ethnography, and I think if you can talk about the role that we're playing as institutional actors and as well as community members or with community members, then it's a stronger story. Thanks, Kyle. A question from Ken Gorby. Yes, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much, Kylie. Um, I, I get the collection uh, that's ongoing and that's wonderful. The use thereof to actually shift perceptions though. Just recently read a lecture by uh, Professor Michael Burley, Beauty, um, where he exampled a uh, Israeli uh, experiment where they took a suburb of Tel Aviv, uh, somewhere to the right of Genghis Khan, I quote, and plastered it with various hate, manifestations of hate, posters and things of this sort. When they tested that suburb a year later against the controls, they found that those people had greatly mollified their views because of the absurdness of the stuff that these people were seeing. And I wonder if in fact some of the collections we are putting together might be best manifest out there beyond the museum and its uh, visitor of a special character, you know. Well, that was the approach that was taken, I mean, a little bit more gently than that. Well, a, a lot more gently than that, but that was certainly one of the approaches that was taken by the Immigration Museum uh, exhibition, which was curated by um, Moya McFadden. Um, it, and it's an, it's an interesting one. And, and uh, it was very much uh, not just look at the impact of this, but look at the expression of it. Um, I think there's a question about who you're speaking to when, you, you know, we always think about audience, like who is the audience of our exhibit or the installation or whatever. And particularly when it comes to materials like what you're speaking about, I, I have real questions about who, who are we talking to? What is the purpose of this? Because, um, and in the case that you're speaking about, maybe it can change the mind of people because it's, it's in a public space. But when you're talking about an exhibition at the Immigration Museum in Melbourne, for instance, um, you know, people who, who are kind of far right wing or whatever, they're not gonna go and visit the museum. So, so this question of how do we bridge this? How do we create dialogue? It's also a question about where do we do it? Um, and who are we speaking to? So, you know, there's a lot of um, material in, sp in school spaces about how you create educational programs. And the question is, who are we, who are we creating them for? Are we creating them for um, people who might be, you know, swayed into thinking like that or whatever? So there's lots of really fascinating questions that arise from that. And, and that's a really fascinating example. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Any more questions out there? We have a little more time left if anyone has got anything else they want to ask. No? Kylie might have a question from online. Oh, there is a question. Ashley. Hello, Ashley. <laughs> it's all right. Um, do you think it is a museum's job to reflect or react? Is there some sort of social time frame museums are bound to be seen as an actor rather than an observer and collector? Should this be policy based? Hmm. I think it's I think it's probably the museum's job to do all of those things at different times. And um, yeah, I think that's kind of reflected by the conversation that we've had uh, and the questions that have come from the floor tonight. Um, but maybe it's the museum's, uh, the, the policy 
task is to identify when those when those sh shifts need to to happen and um, to be agile enough to adopt those the, those different changes. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Ashley, for that question. We might wrap things up there, uh, everyone. Thank you very much to uh, to Papa National Services for hosting us and for everyone coming along tonight. And Kylie, to you especially for beaming in from Canberra and uh, keeping up this this tradition of the, of the Volkling Lecture and posing all these tricky questions for us to ponder. You've given us lots to think about. So thank you very much for that thoughtful presentation, your powerful images and the questions that you've left for us. And please everyone join me in thanking Professor Kylie Message for tonight's lecture. Thank you, Colonel.